Acute Pancreatitis Towards the end of this video, you will learn introduction, classification, etiology, microscopic and macroscopic findings, diagnosis, imaging and treatment of acute pancreatitis. Let's get started with a brief introduction. Acute pancreatitis is an acute inflammatory process of the pancreas and it's caused by an inciting event which damages the pancreatic parenchyma, leading to a chain reaction. Pancreatic injury causes enzymes to leak into pancreas, resulting in autodigestion, leading to more injury and enzyme leakage. This positive feedback cycle causes significant pancreatic edema and fat necrosis. Let's talk a little bit about the classification. Acute pancreatitis is divided into the following. Mild acute pancreatitis, which is characterized by the absence of organ failure and local or systemic complications. Moderately severe acute pancreatitis, which is characterized by transient organ failure, which usually resolves within 48 hours and or local or systemic complications without persistent organ failure, which is about greater than 48 hours. Severe acute pancreatitis, which is characterized by persistent organ failure that may involve one or multiple organs or organ systems. Let's talk a little bit about the etiology. There are several causes of acute pancreatitis. They can be remembered with a mnemonic, get smashed. G stands for gallstones which is obstruction of the duct resulting in backup into the pancreas. Gallstones, including microlithiasis, are the most common cause of acute pancreatitis, accounting for about 40 to 70 percent of all cases. E stands for ethanol, damage to SNR cells resulting in thickening of ductal secretions leading to obstruction can be secondary to ethanol consumption. Alcohol is responsible for about 25 to 35 percent of cases of acute pancreatitis in the United States. Approximately 10 percent of chronic alcoholics develop attacks of clinically acute pancreatitis that are indistinguishable from the other forms of acute pancreatitis. T stands for trauma. Blunt abdominal trauma can cause mechanical damage to pancreas, resulting in acute pancreatitis. S for steroids, M for mumps, A for autoimmune pancreatitis, and S for scorpion sting. H stands for hypocalcemia or hypotriglyceridemia. Serum triglyceride concentrations above 1000 mg per deciliter, which is about 11 millimoles per liter, can precipitate attacks of acute pancreatitis although lower levels may also contribute to severity. Hypertriglyceridemia may account for 1-14% to of cases of acute pancreatitis, both primary, which is genetic, and secondary, which could be acquired disorders of lipoprotein metabolism are associated with hypertriglyceridemia-induced pancreatitis. Acquired causes of hypertriglyceridemia include obesity, diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, pregnancy, and certain medications like estrogen or tamoxifen therapy and certain types of beta blockers. E stands for ERCP. In patients who have undergone an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, which is abbreviated as ERCP, Acute pancreatitis occurs in about 3% of the patients undergoing diagnostic ERCP, 5% undergoing therapeutic ERCP, and about 25% undergoing sphincter of ODI manometric studies. Multiple operator, patient, and procedure-related factors increase the risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis. Important risk factors include lack of ERCP experience, sphincter of odd eye dysfunction, difficult cannulation, and the performance of a therapeutic rather than diagnostic ERCP. D stands for drugs. Certain drugs, especially the sulfur group of drugs, 
result in chemical injury to the acinar cells. Note that ethanol and gallstones are by far the most common, which is an important point to be noted. Now let's discuss about the pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis. Etiologically, there are different mechanisms for pancreatic acinar cell injury. Some of the most common causes are duct obstruction, which can be secondary to cholelithiasis, which results in an ampullary obstruction at the level of ampulla of bladder. It could also be secondary to chronic alcoholism because of ductal concretions. Both of these result in interstitial edema of the cell, which results in impaired blood flow and ischemia. The other cause is acinar cell injury, which can occur secondary to alcohol, certain drugs like didenosin, valproic acid, pentamidine, tetracycline group of drugs, and sulfur-containing drugs like sulfonamides, diuretics. The other causes include trauma, ischemia, certain viruses, predominantly the mumps virus, which all result in release of intracellular proenzymes and lysosomal hydrolases, which results in activation of these enzymes. Eventually, all of these lead to acinar cell injury. The less common modality is a defective intracellular transport. Now, whenever there is metabolic injury or when there is alcohol consumption in excess or if there is duct obstruction, all of these lead to defective delivery of proenzymes to the lysosomal compartment for hydrolysis. As a result, there is intracellular activation of enzymes and results in acinar cell injury. When there is acinar cell injury, it results in activation of the enzymes, which results in interstitial inflammation and edema, along with proteolysis, along with fat necrosis, secondary to lipases and phospholipases, and there can also be hemorrhage because of the release of elastases. All of these factors contribute towards development of acute pancreatitis. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms in a patient to help diagnose acute pancreatitis. Some of the signs and symptoms to help diagnose acute pancreatitis in a patient include severe epigastric abdominal pain associated with radiation to the back. Approximately 90% of patients usually have nausea and vomiting. Pain is often worsen when the patient is supine and improves with sitting or assuming the fetal position and it's an important point to be noted. In some patients, the pain may be in the right upper quadrant or rarely confined to the left side. Most patients have fever and tachycardia as well as severe abdominal pain which is reproducible on examination. Patients with severe acute pancreatitis may have dyspnea due to diaphragmatic inflammation secondary to pancreatitis, pleural effusions, or adult respiratory distress syndrome. Some of the other signs would include a colon sign. A colon sign is a bluish discoloration around the umbilicus resulting from hemoperitoneum. There's another sign called Gray Turner sign, which is bluish red discoloration along the flanks. In serious cases of acute pancreatitis, the patient may develop hypocalcemia, ARDS, which is adult respiratory distress syndrome, and hemodynamic instability. Let's go ahead and look at some of the microscopic findings. In mild forms, there's interstitial edema and focal areas of fat necrosis in the pancreas and peripancreatic fat. Fat necrosis results from enzymatic destruction of the fat cells. The released fatty acids combine with calcium to form insoluble salts that precipitate in situ. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the gross findings. Macroscopically, the pancreas exhibit red-black hemorrhagic areas interspersed with foci of yellow-white chalky fat necrosis. Now, how is it to be diagnosed? 
Acute pancreatitis can be diagnosed by serum levels of pancreatic enzymes and products. Early in the course of acute pancreatitis, there's a breakdown in the synthesis secretion coupling of pancreatic digestive enzymes, whereas synthesis continues while there is a blockage of secretion. As a result, digestive enzymes leak out of the SNR cells through the basolateral membrane to the interstitial space and then enter the systemic circulation. Therefore, there will be increase in serum lipase, which is most specific, and then there will also be increase in serum amylase and decreased levels of calcium. Calcium levels decrease because calcium precipitates as calcium fatty acid soaps that are deposited into the pancreas. Now let's talk about the various imaging modalities that are helpful in diagnosing acute pancreatitis. Several features may be seen on imaging in patients with acute pancreatitis. Abdominal and chest radiographs. The radiographic findings in acute pancreatitis range from unremarkable and mild disease to localized ileus of a segment of small intestine, which is termed as the sentinel loop, or the colon cutoff sign in more severe disease. On abdominal ultrasound, in patients with acute pancreatitis, the pancreas appear diffusely enlarged and hypoechoic. Gallstones may be visualized in the gallbladder or the bile duct. Ultrasound of the gallbladder shows posterior acoustic shadowing produced by a stone in the lumen of the gallbladder. There is no gallbladder wall thickening, a finding that may be seen with acute cholecystitis. Abdominal computed tomography. Contrast enhanced abdominal CT scan findings of acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis include focal or diffuse enlargement of the pancreas with heterogeneous enhancement with intravenous contrast. CT scan of acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis. The CT scan in a 75 year old man with acute interstitial pancreatitis reveals heterogeneous appearance of the pancreas as indicated by the yellow arrows and peripancreatic fat stranding as shown by the arrowhead. Acute pancreatitis should be suspected in a patient with acute onset of a persistent severe epigastric pain with tenderness on palpation on physical. The diagnosis of acute pancreatitis requires the presence of two of the following criteria. Acute onset of persistent, severe epigastric pain that is often radiating to the back. Elevation in serum lipase or amylase to three times or greater than the upper limit of normal. And characteristic findings of acute pancreatitis on imaging which is a CT or an MRI or a transabdominal ultrasonography. Now let's discuss a little bit about the treatment options. The initial management of a patient with acute pancreatitis consists of supportive care with fluid resuscitation, pain control, and nutritional support. In the initial stages, which is within the first 12 to 24 hours of acute pancreatitis, Fluid replacement has been associated with the reduction in morbidity and mortality. Supportive care, unless patient has very severe disease, is required. In mild pancreatitis, per oral intake can be resumed as tolerated, that is, when the patient no longer experiences any postprandial pain. In more severe pancreatitis, enteral nutrition should be initiated in the first 24 to 48 hours. No food or fluids to be consumed orally, which is NPO, IV fluids, and pain control until abdominal pain begins to resolve. This is often referred to as pancreatic rest. If the cause of pancreatitis is found to be a gallstone, the patient should undergo cholecystectomy. Abdominal pain is often the predominant symptom in patients with acute pancreatitis. Adequate pain control requires the use of intravenous opiates such as morphine or fentanyl, usually in the form of a patient-controlled analgesia pump. 
Now, what are the sequelae that can be expected? Multi-system organ failure, like DIC, ARDS, pseudocyst formation, necrotizing pancreatitis, or some of the sequelae that can be expected. Now, the take-home point from this video is that acute pancreatitis can be severe, requiring ICU care, and even intubation.